Welcome to our sixth Red Talk for the University of the Incarnate Word. I'm Dr. Lisa McNary, Dean of Alumni and Parent Relations. A little housekeeping before we get started. If you're joining us on Zoom, please stop your video and mute your mic. And at the end of the presentation, we want everybody to um, join us and we will answer some questions. So please hold your questions till the end. You're welcome to send additional questions in the chat room throughout the presentation. So when the pres presentation begins, please turn off your, um, your mic and your video as well. We have a fun and informative event for you tonight. Sharing her expertise with all of us is Dr. Linda Cavazos. Dr. Linda Cavazos earned her PhD in education with a concentration in organizational leadership from UIW. With her extensive background of more than 25 years as an educator, she has expertise in areas of bilingual education, early childhood instruction, curriculum instruction, and teacher coaching and mentoring. Using her knowledge and expertise, Dr. Cavazos is an adjunct professor and educational consultant. She is also co-founder of Pledge to Teach, which is an educational coaching and consulting service. She is an analytical and conceptual thinker, which has helped her become an early childhood curriculum writer for the Education Service Center Region 20. Her interest in writing and coaching has led to co-authoring of multiple publications, as well as receiving several awards and recognitions. The quote from Gabrielle Bernstein is a mantra for Dr. Cavazos. Allow your passion to become your purpose and it will become your profession. Please welcome Dr. Linda Cavazos. Well, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our presentation this evening. Our red talk this evening is on early childhood development, how to play in nature. So uh, tonight, I really want us to uh, review and think about how you played as a child and think back. And also, let's also uh, look at possibilities of strategies that we can implement for those of you that have uh, young children and how we can make that correlation. I am not here to tell you what to do. I'm only here to provide you ideas and strategies. So some goals that I set for us this evening are very basic, uh, reviewing early childhood, just to kind of go back and touch base with, well, what is early childhood? What does that mean? How does early childhood connect with nature? And I'm going to provide you some very, very simple, simple uh, strategies that, that incorporate nature within play. Next. So in reviewing early childhood, early childhood theoretically begins from birth to the age of eight. So it uh, uh, stops at second grade and right upon entering third grade. And during birth to the age of four years old is what we call the windows of opportunity. And during the windows of opportunity, this is the most critical time for early childhood development. This is where children need many, many opportunities for reading, many opportunities for play, for language, for communication, for creativity, problem solving, critical thinking, which is all part of that early childhood process. And if children are not um, given these, these opportunities, they can become at risk for further development. And so during the windows of opportunities, there's this in inter intricate tapestry of neurons that are developing throughout the brain. And it's important that the neurons further develop into what we call the developmental domains. And it's at this time where children are starting to formulate their learning within their development. Next. So there are four developmental domains. And in research, if you were to Google or further, early, further looking into 
early childhood developmental domains, there might be six, there might be uh, anywhere that's more than four, um, but basically they're, they're the same. Uh, social emotional is sometimes separated. I like to put it together uh, because they go hand in hand. So the four early childhood developmental domains are social emotional, physical, cognitive, and language. And this, this, is, this becomes the whole child. And each, each part of these developmental domains piggyback each other. We can't say that one is more important than another because a, a child needs a full balance of each of these developmental domains. If we look and think about these developmental domains and thinking about how you, uh, develop, how you uh, played as a child, as I had said at the beginning, and we look at where we are now, well, we're in a pandemic, and what has brought concern and attention is the physical domain. That are we playing enough? Are we going outside enough? What's happening right now? And so these developmental domains are, are very, very critical uh, throughout early childhood. Next. So as I mentioned, the early childhood developmental domains, that how critical and important they are uh, to with, within the development, we also have to factor in the, uh, the uh, environment. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the four developmental domains, and I mentioned physical, that right now that that is an area of concern of, uh, of our children playing more outside. Is, the, is uh, too much technology maybe stifling their learning? And when we think of cognition, it's part of the brain development, the intellect. And when we think of language, it's how we are communicating, how we're developing words, how we are developing vocabulary. And of course, social and emotional is uh, uh, identifying emotions and how we socialize. So putting that together and then the variable of the environment is also a critical factor. And when we say environment, you don't need to have the most expensive toys or the most expensive technology. Uh, the environment is about family involvement. It's about reading to your children. It's about interacting, playing with them, allowing them an opportunity to communicate. So the environment is part of that developmental, that, uh, th that developmental process. And of course, play development. Play development, we could do a whole session just on play development. So we are talking about play development. It, it, it comes together in our topic for this evening, but we're focusing more on incorporating nature. Next. <clears throat> so in play development, just to kind of remind us of what play development is, as I mentioned, uh, parents may think that, oh, I have to have the most expensive technology device because I want the best software for my child so they can begin to read, so they can begin to count. Yes, that's very important, but before we jump ahead and we start running before we can crawl, we need to allow children to play and just have open-ended play. If you look at the picture, you see the child uh, that the child in, 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 um, in the corner where the child is having, having the box over their head and, and just uh, imagining that they're an astronaut or they're mad imagining that they're going to the moon. So when, we're, when we are referring to play development, we're looking at problem solving, open-ended creativity, where children are using their own imagination. There has been recent research that has said that allow children to be bored, allow children to have unstructured time for, uh, for activities, meaning that let children be bored, bored and let them find their own creativity place, creativity space, and that allows them to further develop their imagination. And social skills, play development also encompasses social skills where children are interacting, they're learning to share, they're learning to cooperate. 
confidence. It's a confidence builder because now they are in charge of their play and they are in control of their play. And so now they have acquired con con confidence in how they're playing and maybe they're role playing. And so now they feel, uh, feel good about themselves. And it's very healthy for children to play. Children need to play. Uh, it's, it's part of their mental health. Uh, language, as I mentioned earlier, that they're developing vocabulary, they're interacting, they're communicating, uh, they're, they're interacting with others. And it's also a, a growth mindset where they're learning more about their own skills, about who they are. Uh, they're learning also how, um, uh, not only within their confidence, but they're also learning that this is a part of their development, de development because of, of, of the inquiry that they are uh, acquiring while they are being curious about what they are playing and how they are playing. And research has also proven that these skills carry over to adulthood. And we can now, uh, with research, we can now uh, look at uh, leaders and we can look at how they play. There's actually research out there that we can look at uh, uh, leaderships, uh, leadership skills and we can uh, look at how they played, which has factored into how they are a leader, how they interact with others, their adulthood skills, so play development is also uh, part of one's identity. Next. Okay, Richard Louvre has uh, uh, developed this idea. It's not a medical or a physical diagnosis. It is uh, what, he, what he wrote about in his research. And he coined the idea of nature deficit disorder. And it's actually a thing, but it's not, again, it's not a medical diagnosis. And what he found in his research was that children are not in tune with nature. They are spending a lot of time within their electronic devices. They don't know how to climb trees. Uh, they don't know how to jump rope. They don't know how to uh, play, just play outside, run around, climb trees. Uh, just enjoy what being outside is all about. And he went on within his research and talked about that it's also due to uh, real estate. So for example, uh, when I grew up, when I was growing up, I was fortunate to have a large yard and run around. And now homes now have limited yard space uh, and we become dependent on parks and also time, uh, parents may have uh, one to two jobs. And so therefore playing outside uh, may, not, uh, may not work. And so they have to wait until the weekend. And then also there is times have changed. In my day growing up, we played outside until the street light went off or went on, I should say, not off, on, and that was our cue to go inside. I had good parents. I didn't have bad parents, but we had, we, I was, it was a time where we played outside and that was part of our culture. It was part of, of our everyday life. And so I understand now uh, uh, we have to supervise our children. Uh, also technology devices have taken over. And so um, that also has weighed in as well. He calls it this epidemic of inactivity. And he talks about that this is this can be scary because this is our future. And if they are not outside being creative and just running around, how is that going to affect our future? And then he tables it as children need vitamin N, <laughs> vitamin N meaning nature. Next. And of course, it's always about keeping it safe, safety first always checking the area of, of where children are playing. Um, I know this is South Texas, so we always have to look at uh, the ground and look at where our, our children are playing. Of course, that's utmost importance. Also making sure that your children have insect repellent, uh, maybe they're wearing, um, and wearing sunscreen, maybe a hat, sunglasses, and of course, always, always supervising children. Next. 
So I'm going to uh, share ideas and, st and strategies uh, that I have uh, implemented throughout my teaching and my research. And these are just everyday, everyday ideas. It isn't anything that is out of the ordinary. You'd be surprised, just the simple little things that we can do can really, really uh, further develop skills, further develop learning, uh, and, fur and further develop just play, which also, as we mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, encompasses uh, skills such as creativity, social skills, cognitive development, and, and so forth. So the idea is that uh, the whole idea of nature is that we are interacting and playing with natural resources. If I can share a just a, a, a quick story, um, it, it's not in the slides, but just to kind of uh, kind of uh, give you an idea of how nature is always is always is now embedded in me. I had a um, a meeting today. I teach in higher education, and we had a a meeting. And my car, um, uh, the check engine light came on yesterday. So I went into the car dealership. And so I tried to find a private place. I found a private place and it was at a park, it was uh, like a little park area. So I sat there at the, on the benches and I was waiting and we were in, in the meeting and we were kind of just catching up myself and my colleagues and I'm sitting and I'm right in nature. And so as I was waiting, I, I, I counted, I counted three spiders uh, that were, uh, there was a rail and there was some spider webs. I counted the spiders. I also looked down and I saw leaves with holes in them. I counted the sticks and I was just, just in tune to nature and what I was seeing. And so I'm now <laughs> always doing that because this has been part of my research. So with that example, it's about the freedom within that space. So just in that area, there was so much learning that uh, if there was someone, an early learner there with me, I could have taken it to town <laughs> with play development playing in, and playing in nature. Uh, so that's the idea. The idea is connecting with nature, but more importantly, it's about the freedom within that space. So we don't have to feel like, oh, well, I don't have a big yard. I don't have a lot of grass. Well, what is what does nature look like? within your space, within your, within your residence? What does it look outside? What does that look like? Simple things as collecting leaves, walking barefoot in the grass. Those are some examples. Next, please. And it's up to uh, us, the families, that in allowing our children to go outside and playing with them outside, we're giving them opportunities for good health we're giving them the opportunity for fresh air, uh, a mental break, the opportunity to exert energy. And uh, it is important that we break away from electrical devices, adults as well. And also there's also research on a, a adult play as well, as far as uh, uh, connecting with nature as well. So it's an all around win-win. Uh, children may say they are bored when they go outside. Uh, what do I do? I don't want to get dirty. And so it's up to us to initiate uh, that, uh, that opportunity. And it's, of course, it's, all, it's also dependent on their age level. Make it a family activity. It doesn't have to be structured. It's just the idea that unstructured play, as I mentioned to you, just within my, with, within my space of being outside, there was so much uh, there was so much learning and also fun that uh, that can happen, but we have to initiate that as well. Next. There's research, extensive research, believe it or not, on mud. Yes, uh, mud uh, is actually healthy. <laughs> it boosts the immune system. Growing up, um, we played in mud. Um, my brother and I were always uh, playing outside and we made mud pies and we were fortunate that we, we had that opportunity and we didn't know at that time that it boosted uh, our immune system. There are several studies out there. Um, there's two uh, that I'm sharing uh, here. Yay, you got, you liked, I got a chap that you used to make mud pies. Yay, um, it's so fun to make mud pies. Uh, from the University of College L London, uh, they have found that just interacting with soil, I know this may sound gross, but interacting with soil is also healthy bacteria uh, because it produces, serotonin, it produces serotonin 
and that's a natural mood stabilizer. So when children, yay, someone used to run in the rain and splash in the mud, awesome, yes. Um, so this is a natural mood stabilizer. And so what that basically means is that it's calmness and it's also, it's also healthy bacteria. So it's not gonna hurt the child. Of course, obviously when they come inside, you know, they need to wash up and make sure they don't put, you know, put their hands in their mouth or their nose or their ears. And so, but the idea is that it is okay if children play in mud and soil and dirt, it's healthy. The other study was actually a 20 year study that came out of, of the University of Chicago. And they followed uh, these children for 20 years and they fought, fought, found that in their adulthood, because they played with mud, because they played outside in, in the outdoors, they found that they had a less chance, uh, they, they now have less um, uh, health issues such as heart problems and they don't have any autoimmune uh, diseases. So they found that um, by playing outdoors and playing in mud, that when you reach adulthood, you are, uh, more, more likely to have a healthier immune system, also uh, less heart issues, and a stronger uh, immune system. Next, please. Someone said in the chat that they played, uh, also played in the rain. I still like to do that. <laughs> I like to go outside and just get wet and just feel the rain. Um, and um, I have been fortunate that I have been in other countries when it rains. And um, last year I was in Calgary, Canada, and I actually played in the rain. <laughs> I stepped, I, I was, we were, we were, we were walking, coming back from the restaurant and everyone's running in, not me. I just wanted to feel the rain and taste the rain. And it, it was so cool and crisp. And so I just like to do those. I just like to do that. <laughs> so playing in the rain is also a really, is, is a good idea, um, not to not to fully get wet, but just to feel a uh, sensory exploration of what that feels like. Um, I know in, um, they have actually uh, talked about it, that there are schools in the Northeast part of the United States that in the rain, they, they literally go outside and it becomes a science activity. Uh, they also play in the snow. It becomes part of their everyday outdoor play. Um, and so when you have the opportunity that let have children wear rain boots, go outside with a raincoat, uh, step out in the rain and just for a few minutes, just for a few seconds, just what does that feel like? Uh, now they have, uh, yay, you take your kids out in the rain uh, at your school. Good. That, that's I'd love to hear that. Um, they are they have now super expensive, cool mud kitchens. Who would have who would have who would have thought? <laughs> um, mud kitchens, you can actually buy them, you can order them. They're different prices. They range up to, they can get expensive, $100, $200. Um, but uh, you can do a homemade one. All you need are is pots and pans, a water hose, uh, ice cube trays, whatever you have, containers. Um, and also making sure that children are wearing clothing that you're that they're comfortable with that you know that it's going to get muddy old play clothes and let them just go at it. Uh, maybe have them sit on something, um, clean them up before they come in. Um, so you can make your own to do simple uh, mud kitchen or you can buy a, snoot, a super fancy one. Uh, the one on the right, if you can see it, it has pots and pans. It's very uh, very well designed, um, but you don't need to spend a lot of money. Um, uh, just do something simple and basic. Next, please. Okay, so um, yay, taking your kids outside. I love to hear stories like that, splashing in muddle and in puddles. Kids love that. So just to re just to review the developmental domains and thinking about how all of these uh, domains fall into just everyday play what that looks like in mud play, what that looks like in stepping outside and just feeling the rain. So keeping that in mind as we go more into the ideas and strategies uh, that I will be sharing. Next, please. Okay, so I'm gonna take you back. Um, this was my house that I grew up in, in Houston, Texas. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you, um, it actually looks exactly the same. Uh, there were more trees but I wanted you to get a feel of, of uh, what just running around in play is like um, and how it, how, um, okay, I can answer that question. Yes, I can answer that question if you remind me uh, before we end the session. 
Uh, so the reason why I'm sharing this is that uh, this was my house in Houston, Texas. Of course, we had there were more trees, but I was a a climb a climber of trees. I loved to climb trees, and I ran around that yard. I played. My brother and I. Uh, that sidewalk was my stage, and I did. I had so much fun, and I just ran around. And a court, my yard was fortunate. I, I grew up with a big yard. But just the fact that I, I would run from tree to tree, we played all kinds of outdoor games, but it's just the idea of just look at what you have, look at your space and your outdoor space and what can you do to incorporate that play development that incorporates nature. So we had a pecan tree, we, we picked pecans, I climbed trees, um, we uh, played all kinds of outdoor games, um, I, we caught butterflies, uh, uh, we didn't have a garden, um, but uh, we had so much fun just from running and playing outside. Next, please. So th personally, through my experiences, and I want you to, uh, <laughs> yes, I ripped my jeans too um, and scraped my knees when I climbed trees, uh, when I climbed uh, the trees. Uh, critical thinking, creativity, language, uh, this is me. So this is my, this is, uh, these are uh, my uh, takeaways as an adult, because I was fortunate to have a rich nature uh, experience growing up. So today I feel like I'm a critical thinker. I, uh, I love being, I don't think I'm creative. I'm not artsy, but I can be creative on, on, on repurposing things and taking things and, and making them better. I love words. Uh, I love to take walks and I'm all about, you know, just seeing things and being more observant uh, in, uh, in nature. Uh, someone, uh, yes, next please. Uh, someone mentioned about ripping their jeans. I love to climb trees so much that, and I, and I am short and I used to climb trees. And one time my parents couldn't find me and I was hidden in the tree and a uh, branch broke down. I couldn't climb down <laughs> and I got in so much trouble for that, but I, I still have fun. Okay, so nature. I also was fortunate to have a sandbox. I remember my parents ordering the sandbox from the Sears Roebuck catalog. I'm probably a lot older than you all. Um, and so ordering things from a catalog <laughs> from the Sears Roebuck, Roebuck catalog was a big thing. Um, the, the sandbox on the left was similar to my sandbox. It didn't have a, a, a cover. My dad um, uh, put a cover over it. And I, I was about, uh, I think like from the ages of four to six that I had a sandbox. And I just loved playing in the sand. This was similar to the one that I had, uh, but my, my canopy was more pastel colored. Uh, sandboxes can be expensive, but you can do very simple tubs of sand. You can buy a big thing of sand at Home Depot for like $5, and you can just let children just play with sand. And there's so much learning, and so, so much creativity. Um, there's a picture there with plastic toys. Uh, you can use whatever you may have, uh, but it's a very, very open-ended, uh, very textured sensory exp uh, ex uh, exploration type of activity. Next, please. Okay, so we're gonna now slowly get into this to the ideas, a scavenger hunt. You can do so many types of scavenger hunts. And I just, I found this one because I thought it was different. You can, and you don't even have to make it so structured. You just said, okay, let's go out and play and let's try to find something that, that's bumpy and let's try to find, and maybe take a picture of it uh, or just talk about it and just and endure in that moment. You don't have to do 20, to look for 20 things. Uh, just in one nature walk can be maybe two things. And you talk about it, you play, you interact, you ask questions. And then the next day you, 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 you do something different, um, uh, asking them maybe they could uh, roll in the grass. Of course, you know, you always, as we said earlier, safety first, uh, jumping over, what could they climb? And of course, you know, again, safety. Uh, when we say squishy, they don't have to pick it up if they don't want to. Uh, most cases, they're very curious and they're gonna pick it up anyway. Um, but it just, you, of course, we have to be careful with that, but just having them look for for different items with nature. What smells, uh, what, what are some good smells? What sounds do you hear? Um, what, what is heavy that you think we couldn't pick up that we could see? Do you think we could literally pick up this tree? Uh, just, to, just engaging uh, within the developmental domains. Next, please. 
Okay, so I'm gonna just share some activities that can be used in a nature walk. Uh, listening activities, hearing the wind. If you don't hear wind, well, why not? Well, why do you think it's not windy today? Uh, leaves under your feet or just touching the leaves. Why do the leaves have holes in them? Do we hear birds singing? Where do you think, what do you think the birds are saying? Trying to find an animal that you might see in the tree. I saw a lot of squirrels today, as I mentioned from my example when I was sitting outside uh, waiting for my meeting to start. And so just these four simple ideas are part of, of listening. And again, it's part of our, uh, uh, part of the developmental domains. Next, please. Touching uh, the tree bark, feeling the texture. Uh, how does it feel when the sun is on your skin, uh, when you're standing in the sun versus in the shade? Uh, the wind in your hair, a smooth or a rough rock. Uh, what about sticks? Uh, what different types of sticks do you see? Uh, why do you think uh, the, the sticks fell off the tree? That's a good inference. And you can say something like, uh, uh, maybe the squirrel was was fat uh, way too much and it caused the, the branches to fall. And so that's why the branch fell and it broke and now it's a stick. Uh, that's a good example. And let the children come up with inference. You don't have to tell them, oh, yay, you, you, you uh, just came up with an inference. Just let them explore the opportunity. Next, please. What they can look for, uh, something purple, uh, that's just enough purple, it's my favorite color, uh, a pine cone. Uh, pine cones here in Texas are so different from uh, in other states. Um, if you've ever want, wanted to research that many, many moons ago, uh, when I was a teacher and I traveled to Rhode Island, and at that time we could uh, bring, we wouldn't have to go through all of the security clearances and checks that we have to go through through the airport. And I remember bringing pine cones. I know I'm such a teacher. And I brought big, big, gigantic pine cones, not the kind you get at Michael's where they smell very perfumed uh, type. No, this were, these were large pine cones. And I remember putting them in my, in my science discovery station and students were just like, wow, amazed. Our pine cones here in Texas may be a little bit smaller um, in comparison to uh, the pine cones I had brought from another state. So that was so intriguing to them. Different rocks. Uh, a letter or pick a letter. What do you what do you find that begins with a particular letter? Looking at different kinds of leaves. Uh, did you find a spider web? Uh, what about the clouds? Oh, and the picture there you see. I teach at uh, several universities and in, in San Antonio, and that is at taken at Texas A&M San Antonio. They have a beautiful uh, garden area and beautiful colored uh, flowers. So just take just uh, appreciating the colors can also be part of that nature walk. Next, please. Critical thinking, just to remind us that uh, when you are asking children to look at the different colors, look at the different textures and comparing it, and you're also doing analysis and they're comparing and they're contrasting, and that's part of cognitive developing. Asking them to describe what they see is, is developing vocabulary, language, uh, how does it feel? Now they're coming in touch with their emotions. They're coming in touch now with their senses. And again, building language and building um, uh, vocabulary, communication skills, and of course, an appreciation for nature. Next, please. Okay, so as I mentioned, I teach at, um, at I teach in higher ed. And I teach uh, science, I teach science for uh, future educators, or we say pre-service teachers. And I also teach early childhood classes. And I am with a colleague right now, we are uh, writing a book. Uh, we just uh, published two articles for a science, uh, teaching science process skills with nature. And one of the activities that we do in our training and we actually were working with one of our local Head Start schools here in San Antonio. And we did a teacher training and we passed out the color paint swatches that you get at Home Depot or Lowe's, uh, Walmart, um, 
Uh, I always uh, tell my students that uh, they know me. I go in and I get and and I you know and I and they they know me already, <laughs> and I I share uh, this this idea with my students and they love it. And so my uh, pre service teachers or if we're doing the training, literally we go outside with uh, our swatch cards and we color swatch cards and we match colors within nature. And so this is a perfect idea for early childhood because now they're seeing that red is just not like the red crayon. They're seeing that it has different palettes and different tones of, of red. It's not so much important to know the specific color of uh, the name of it. It's more looking at matching the color uh, with something that they see in nature. So it's, very, it's a very tangible hands-on activity. Next, please. I was doing, I was coaching uh, early childhood teachers at a child care center in San Antonio Independent School District. And they had an herb garden. This was many, uh, not many, but maybe about six years ago. And um, they had an herb garden and the infants and toddlers would sit in the herb garden and they would uh, play, they would touch the leaves. They were even allowed to taste the herbs. Um, and that is, that's so stimulating because you could smell the herbs. And so um, the teacher standing right there, if you look on the left, you see something blue, that's her shoe. <laughs> so she's right there. But this is real critical in early childhood that they're uh, stimulating their sensory exploration through smells and they can taste it because it is, it is an herb, um, but she would rotate and have the children sit there and just manipulate and feel the textures and smell the aromas. On the right, uh, my uh, student, we don't say student teachers anymore, we say clinical teachers. My clinical teacher uh, did an awesome science activity with nature and I was guiding her and I gave her some suggestions. And so at her campus, she at her assigned school, she um, brought in all different types of, of, of nature items. This was a bilingual classroom and uh, it was the Discovery Center. And so um, she scaffolded a lot of their learning, uh, just very open-ended uh, with, uh, with items from nature. You see acorns, you see uh, different sizes of acorns, leaves, uh, sticks. Next, please. This is at the campus at uh, Texas A&M San Antonio, where I also teach. Of course, you know we're all virtual right now, but I had to go on campus recently, and I and I thought this just it caught my attention. I said I'm, I'm I taught he I, I taught here last semester and years before, and I never really really paid attention to the the trees. And so as I was walking to uh, the office, I saw I saw it, and I said, Wow! I said. All that area, children could do so much math right there. They could walk and count the steps from one tree to another. Um, they could uh, run, they could walk, they could hop. Uh, that is also great for their physical development. And just, I mean, it's just an open area. And then on the right, uh, there's a garden, there's a nice uh, sitting area, the same, uh, the same type of activity that they could walk, they could explore, um, but just something as simple as just walk, uh, walking, counting the steps, um, uh, going from a tree to a tree, looking at which one is larger, which one uh, is, is uh, shorter. Uh, you could also look at uh, the different barks uh, from the trees as well. Next, please. These are my students uh, from uh, UTSA, and we actually do a nature training as part of their curriculum. I teach, as I mentioned, I teach the science for pre-service teachers. These are my bilingual students, and we were at Hardberger Park, and we actually do the training out there, but we're going to be doing it virtual this semester. And so you could, you could get, we actually, we, we get hula hoops. And we go outside of the education building center and we take the hula hoop and we use the hula hoop to enclose the area so we can look at what do we see there in nature. And we dive deep. We look at the leaves. We look at do we see an earthworm? Do we see a really holy? What do we see? Why does this area look more dry? And of course, it's more, more at a, a higher, very higher, higher adult level. But just the idea that using a hula hoop can help. Um, uh, close in space for children to see and just focus within that area. And then of course you could take it a step further with soil, they could write about it, they could draw pictures. Uh, that's also bringing in uh, writing, uh, writing and literacy skills as well. Next please. 
Uh, collecting rocks, I did um, uh, use this picture. I, I didn't put it on there, but I did get this picture from Pinterest only because I couldn't find my picture. But to give you an idea of, of uh, what, uh, what you can also do when you collect rocks, you can use them for counting. They can put their rocks to form their name, uh, pebbles, uh, uh, little pieces of gravel, even sticks. Uh, the idea that they're using nature in association with their name and what that looks like. What does that feel like? What does my name feel like if I use sticks versus rocks? Uh, that's also another, another activity. Um, this activity also, and I did put the, the name at the bottom. Um, this is an activity that uh, was shared uh, through, uh, um, uh, I believe it was Reggio Emilia. And I, I, did give it, I did give credit to it at the bottom of the slide. Uh, this is so, I thought this cool, this idea is so cool. We do something similar, but I liked this idea better. Um, looking at sticks and maybe uh, how can you move them around and what, what does it look like? And this was actually an early childhood activity in one of the classrooms, and they called it dancing sticks. And you notice that every stick has, is in a different position. Um, so I just, I just thought that was super cool. So just maybe even manipulating sticks as well can also be fun. Next, please. OK. Um, I, um, as I mentioned to you, I am uh, working uh, with a uh, partnership with one of the Head Start schools. And we are, uh, we were piloting the, the idea of using nature uh, in, their, in their classrooms and early childhood programs for dual language learners. And so uh, that, was the, that was the piloted project. And then I'm also an instructional coach at uh, uh, several schools in San Antonio, here in San Antonio, excuse me. And so those are acorns and they're huge. This one particular school, that I'm at, they have a huge 100 year old tree that there's so many acorns and they're just all over the place. So the teacher there at that school was my student at UIW uh, many moons ago. And so she, uh, she gets her three-year-olds to collect the acorns for me. So I, vis I, I well, haven't gone lately because we're virtual, but with, prior to COVID, I would go to the school like once every two weeks and her students literally would go on an acorn hunt and save me the acorns because I use them in my training and I also use them when I teach higher education. And then on the right side, uh, and I do have per permission for these pictures because we were piloting the project. Uh, those are the students that we were working with at one of our Head Start schools. And the students, uh, I, I took the acorns to their classrooms and they had a, they had a field day with the acorns because they had never seen acorns that large before. And so they're writing, they're exploring, they're using the magnifying glasses. Next, please. Sink and float. You can look at, uh, just get a tub of water, what, uh, what uh, sunk, what floated. Uh, the counting sticks. This is another activity. I believe I borrowed that picture because I couldn't find my picture. But that gives you an idea that with the sticks, they can use them as counting for number operations, uh, for adding. Um, it's helping, again, with, with math skills. Next, please. Melting crayons, super fun. Uh, foil and cookie cutters and get the, those broken crayons, put it outside and you'll have a shape uh, colored uh, big crayon. Uh, a kid, uh, that's a fun activity that you can do. Allowing children to play with the water hose. Um, if it's a sunny day, they might be able to make rainbows with, uh, with uh, holding the water hose a certain way. Uh, that sometimes happens. It just, just depends on the angle uh, of where you're standing. And then with the sun, that's super fun. Um, and just letting them play and interact with the water hose. That's also fun too. Next, please. Shapes of rocks, letting children uh, look at the shape. They could trace it. They can uh, compare which shapes were uh, the different sizes. Also looking at the textures letting them stack rocks and see what happens, how many they could stack, uh, what problem solving, critical thinking skills. Next, please. So again, recapping with the developmental domains, vocabulary expression for language, uh, uh, cognition, we have the open-ended thinking, creativity, 
Um, and again, the physical movement, we want children to just get out. It's healthy, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, that this is this uh, is something that is an area uh, of concern. Are our children able to do this since we are in the pandemic? And it can be something as simple as just running outside in your front yard or in your backyard. Uh, social emotional development, allowing children to uh, begin to recognize uh, their emotions and learning how to express their emotions. It's relaxing and also an appreciation and interaction with nature. Next, please. I had to share this one. Uh, this was when I was in Calgary, Canada. And again, um, this, was, this was like maybe before it rained, but as I mentioned before, um, outside of my hotel room, I was walking to the, there was the University of Calgary, which was two blocks uh, down the street from where I was walking towards, uh, walking to, and I saw this beautiful plant, this beautiful plant, and I said, look at those beautiful colors, and those colors are so, and re, maybe it stuck out to me, because Tamus, uh, Texan M. San Antonio, has those same colors in their, in their garden, and so I take a picture of that, and I would walk by it, and it just, I just was so, so soothing to see that right in the middle of downtown, where there's like no nature, <laughs> but just to see that, oh, it's, you know, it's calming. On the right side, this bird followed me for like three days. Um, I researched what bird is this, and it is a black-billed uh, magpie. Uh, they're very common in, uh, down in, in, in Calgary. And it was interesting because it just followed me. It fly, would fly and then it would stop and it would walk next to me. And for, at first I was like, this is kind of weird. Why is this happening? And I noticed that it wasn't doing that with like the other people that were walking by. Well, maybe it was a guardian angel. I don't know, but that bird followed me. And so I, uh, maybe because I knew I, I knew I appreciated nature. <laughs> I don't know, but um, I just thought that was really interesting. So I had, I had to share that. So everywhere I go now, I just have this appreciation for nature. Next, please. So in conclusion, play in nature. Uh, it's healthy for the whole child. As we mentioned, it's, it boosts the immune system. It uh, helps in the development for, the, uh, for all of the domains for the whole child. And of course, it's, it supports language development. So I hope you have, uh, this, this was helpful and I hope that you have some ideas to take with you about just playing in nature. Next, please. Those are my references, and just to kind of uh, just, it's, I think it's important to always put where you got your research. Um, so I just, I'm just putting that in there. And a quote from Maria Montessori, a child more than anyone else is a spontaneous observer of nature. And that's my email address. You're welcome to email me. Let's say you tried one of my ideas and, and you added another piece to it, or you have an idea. I always like to learn from my participants. So that's my um, email address if, if you'd like to reach out to me. Thank you, everyone. I hope this was helpful. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Cavazos. We do have a few questions. There was one that came in through the um, chat on Zoom and it is in outside play, how much should be self play or peer play or is it equal? I, I, I believe it should be equal. There should be a balance. I believe that child, it's, it, it's helpful if children can play with others that are close within their age, their age, their age. Um, but play just in general, I think is, 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 is the first step. So uh, yes, I think that there, it, there should be some, uh, e it should be equal. Okay, and there a few of them you have already answered. Let's see, is it good for children, young children, two or three years old to have extra classes in the afternoon, such as swimming, soccer, or is it better to spend time with parents or playing on their own and why? I believe that there should be a balance. I believe that a swimming, a learning to play an instrument, uh, all of these extra activities are, are part of social emotional development. And I think that that is part of of their of their of their well being, and I think that that I think that is that that that's important and that's wonderful. But I also feel that children should also have opportunity to play on their own. Uh, let them be bored. 
guide them to find their own niche of creativity. But I do feel, feel that they can do both um, and, and finding that, that balance. Play with them as parents and also let them, let them interact individually on their own as well. Thank you. Uh, let's see. How many times a day and for how long should a child be outdoors when you have minimal time on certain days? Okay, I know right now with prior COVID, I know, you know, uh, we are, um, you know, being very, very careful with that. But as a family, um, I feel that you can do something as simple as taking a break and taking 15 minutes outside. If you can every day, I think that they need to be outside. Prior COVID, it was outside every day in, in schools. And I know now they're limited. So think about that because they're limited. What is that? What 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 is that saying that our our children are not exerting? And also think of the health benefits as well. So if you can take them outside for five ten minutes, a nature walk, let them just sit sit outside, feel the fresh air, and then slowly maybe get uh, uh, gravitate to doing some kind of nature activity. But I think a little bit every day, if that is not possible, then what can you do on the weekends? And maybe on the weekends you can you can make up for that time. Uh, if, you, if you can't take them outside or give them some type of play inside where maybe they could do uh, what we call brain breaks where they're dancing, they're moving. It's not really nature, but if you have items from nature, like uh, the leaves or things that you've collected, let them interact with that inside. Um, and that's still, that's still a benefit. Thank you. All the other questions, it looks like you've answered them throughout your presentation. So we really appreciate your time with us. It was a fabulous presentation. And for Thank all you. of those watching, we do have <laughs> another Red Talk next month. We have one every single month. So um, stay tuned for our next Red Talk. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.